You all see my screen, Greg? We can. All right, let's get rocking, I guess. Time for takeoff. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to Neural Pearls. Tonight uh, is Tuesday and we're going to, it's part of our national webinar series. Tonight we have Dr. Joe Salka, uh, diplomat, uh, is going to be doing our lecture uh, tonight. Let me do a, a bio for Joe. Uh, Dr. Salka is an attending optometric physician at the Center for Sight in Sarasota, Florida. This is a large medical practice where he focuses on glaucoma management and neuroophthalmic disease. What an appropriate subject to be talking about tonight, Joe. He is also the director of optometric business development at USI. He was a former professor at the uh, uh, professor of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years where he served as the chief of the advanced care service and director of glaucoma service at the college's eye clinic. He was the program coordinator and supervisor for the optometric disease residency. Dr. Salka is a founding member of both the optometric glaucoma society and the optometric retina society. He is also the founder and former chair of the neuro ophthalmic disorders and optometry special interest group for the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Salka is a glaucoma diplomat of the American Academy of Optometry. He is also a partner and friend and co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. With a big round of applause, please give Joe a virtual round of applause. Thank you, Joe, for being here. Thank you, Greg. I'm looking forward to doing this. I think uh, really, uh, neuro-ophthalmic disease is what optometry should be, that we should be, should be helping out uh, because neuro-ophthalmologists are, are few and far between. I think we have about one and a half, 1.5 neuro-op in our general area. And I think one is, uh, is on leave for a while. So it's very, very tough to get people uh, into neuro-op, even in my, in my general area. So that's why patient, our patients are being, being sent to me. And neuro-op is nothing more than the science of figuring things out. And a lot of what I do is what I call neuro-op nonsense. And uh, but it's important to recognize that and differentiate from the serious things so the patients can get the, uh, to get the appropriate help. Now, I am or have been a consultant in the last, last 12 months uh, or a Speakers Bureau Advisory Board member for advices, ice and Bausch and Loam. I've got no financial interest in uh, any products. Uh, and most important, I've created this, uh, this talk myself without outside influences. So the first pearl I can tell you, is, and this is where we all have to be in agreement, is you got to know what can kill, maim, and blind immediately. We, th there are some things out there that are extremely bad. And various people who deal with neuroopal, you know, feel differently about the list. But and there's some things that are pretty much around this list that can kill a person, can maim a person, can blind a person. But once you've figured out what the bad stuff is, and you know it's not that, you actually have time to figure things out. And in the course of a big, busy day, when you might be, you know, with you and your technicians, you know, you may have patients schedule every 15 minutes and you have workup techs and, and people do special testing. You don't, have to, you don't have to solve the world's problems in one day. You know, take your time, get the testing if you know that it's not an emergency, and then you can actually figure things out. I, I will tell you that I, I do that all the time. You know, things come to me. Sometimes it's the ride home where it all comes, it, it all comes together for me. And Greg, that brings me to polling question number one already. I'm gonna ask you to launch that. And do you recognize anything in these pictures, Greg? Well, let me come off a of mute here. Um, mm -hmm. I recognize Lori for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I recognize that as being Australia. Yes, uh, that is, that is Sydney Harbor. And that is the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And that's the Opera House. What many people don't know, realize is once you get real close to it, it's not white, it's actually beige. So our polling question, which of the following is a neuroophthalmic emergency? Is acute painful ptosis, acute painful vision loss, acute painful double vision, acute painful dilated pupil, or acute painful myotic pupil. And what you see, my wife is holding a wild cockatoo. 
Now when I say wild, it's a wild bird, but it's in the botanical gardens and it, it's a custom to people, but they are cheeky little birds and one gave me a pretty good nip one time. But uh, this, uh, you know, the picture I've taken here is from the botanical gardens. That's my wife for the cockatoo. All right, give it one more second or two for another question or answer to roll in. Okay, that's it. Calling it and sharing it. Calling it and sharing it. I, I think I think that's tremendous. Uh, it's a it's a pretty pretty good split here. Acute painful ptosis, uh, Horner syndrome, carotid dissection. Acute painful vision loss, giant cell arteritis. Acute painful double vision, third nerve palsy. Acute painful dilated pupil, uh, third nerve palsy from aneurysm. Acute painful meiotic pupil, uh, carotid dissection causing a a Horner syndrome. These are all good answers. You know, these are these are all very good answers. And what I want you to understand is acute painful anything is a neuroophthalmic emergency. So if a patient comes in, it's acute, it's painful, whatever it is ophthalmically, you got to consider that to be an emergency. Now, I told you, you don't have to solve all the world's problems in a single day. Here's, a, I think, one of the best pearls I, I can give you is you should consider, and of course, you know, rules, you know, there are exceptions to rules, but the urgency of your evaluation is going to be dictated by the duration of the condition. How long has it been there? You know, sudden vision loss of two hours, you got two hours to figure that out. Double vision of, of three days, you got three days to figure that out. You know, something that's been there for a month, you, you got a month to figure it out. Something that's been there for two years, you know, go home, you bother me, you're, you're, you're perfectly normal. You know, so however long something has been there is how, how long you have to figure things out. He's a 46 year old male who woke up three months earlier not being able to see out of his right eye. Uh, he's a light perception in the right eye, 20 20 in the left. He's got disc pallor, no elevation, no swelling, no other concurrent findings. Uh, doesn't remember his last medical examination, so he's got no medical history that's known. And he saw one of my residents at the time, and you know, she got nervous and she didn't, uh, she didn't phone her friend, she didn't reach out to me. Uh, she got nervous. She sent the patient to the emergency room. And I can tell you, when a person goes into the emergency room, with any sort of ocular issue, they're going to get a non-contrast enhanced uh, CT of the head because that's what they do. They're looking for an intracranial bleed. After that, they're pretty much out of their depth. That's that. You know, that's all they have. You know, that's their that's their bag of tricks. So. Sending the emergency room in a situation like this, not knowing exactly what, you know, what you're dealing with, isn't going to help them at all. How long do we have to figure this out? He's been blind for three months. We've got three months to figure this out. There is no emergency here. Greg, I know you like visual fields. You're, you're a visual field aficionado. One of my important uh, pearls is look at the visual field grayscale in glaucoma patients. You know, I mean, actually all, uh, all patients, but you know, especially glaucoma patients, because with glaucoma patients, you're expecting there to be field loss. I mean, that kind of makes sense. And great, did, did I spell that? Is it grayscale with an E or with an A? Did I do that wrong? I always forget that. I don't know, I, I, I accept both. Okay. <laughs> but you know, we've, we've always taught, and I taught uh, the students and residents, when you're looking at a visual field, the pattern deviation is, the retro lenticular age mass vision loss on a patient. And it's no more than that. But I, I've heard other, other, uh, other people teach that you only look at the, at the pattern deviation. Well, here's, a here's three patients uh, who are diagnosed and or treated for glaucoma. And this is their pattern deviation. And Greg, I'm not gonna hold you, but do these, you know, do these fall in the realm of possibility for glaucoma? Well, they certainly fall into the realm of glaucoma, but there's some cases here where it kind of breaks the rule where it looks a little bit worse on the temporal side than the nasal side. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, if you got a glaucoma patient, you're looking only at the pattern deviation, you're seeing loss that may correspond to things you see in the fundus, so you're pretty good. But the... Uh, here are their uh, here are their grayscales. Now, are you sure you want to just keep treating them for glaucoma? 
Here's a patient where we actually have a bitemporal defect. Here's glaucoma and a pituitary adenoma. This patient has an arcuate defect, which is a lot denser here. If you look at the corresponding visual field defect in the other eye that stops at the horizontal, that has a right, right inferior quadrant defect. And this is a patient who was just referred to me with uh, low pressures and disc hemorrhage, uh, very notched nerves and glaucoma. And when I ran the visual field, she, she looked like this. And of course I got imaging and she had uh, not an acute, but a recent stroke. And I've been trying to get her into stroke neurology. So always look at the grayscale. It's actually very helpful in identifying, you know, when you look here, we don't really see all that neurogenic pattern. But when we look at the grayscale, we can see a neurogenic pattern. I think we're all taught you don't pay attention to the grayscale and neuro op is actually very important. Yeah, what did I hear one time, Joe? You know, that's a good place to put your coffee cup. Uh, you know, and I, yep. you know, just drives you know drives Joe and I crazy, right? If there's seven things on a visual field, they put the seven things there for a reason. So exactly. So you can certainly see these these patterns. I think that's uh, very important. Uh, Ashley, do you agree with me? Just nod your head if you do. Very good. Thank you, Ashley. So what are the bad things we have to worry about? Well, giant cell arteritis, which is any sudden vision loss in the elderly. Pituitary apoplexy, where patients have headache, field loss sometimes, uh, most of the time, a diplopia. Aneurysm, where pupils can be very helpful to us. Papilledema, which is really a clinical suspicion uh, that is supported by testing. And carotid dissection, when it manifests as part of Horner's syndrome. That brings me to polling question number two. When encounter, what is the most important diagnosis to consider when encountering any sudden vision loss in the elderly? Is it giant cell arteritis or is it blankety blank, 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 blank? Now I've got a few pictures from Australia because we have been toying with the idea of going to Australia. You saw some nice things earlier, Greg. Now, what we see here on the left is a 12 to 14 foot salt, saltwater crocodile, which is absolutely lethal to humans, they're killers. And the other is a carpet python, which is across the road from where I was staying uh, in the uh, rainforest. Still wanna to go to Australia there, Greg? Absolutely. If they live there, I can live there. I just need to make sure I don't do anything, uh, you know, something crazy to get me killed. Exactly. <laughs> Which but, you know, this almost kind of looks like your backyard, to tell you the truth, and maybe inside your house there with the snake. So Indeed. Well, I think this is an easy one. We're going to, I think we can probably stop it. This is the only time we have ever got a 100% cons uh, consensus. I'm very happy about that. All right. 66-year-old female, sudden vision loss uh, on a Friday afternoon. She comes in 2400, but you know she had a long-standing macular scar, so her central acuity hasn't changed, but she did notice inferior vision loss for about a day. Now, she had an inferior arthroscotoma measured. Uh, she had disc edema, a little bit pallor, no hemorrhages, no TL and jectatic vessels. Uh, the left eye was a very small, crowded disc at risk, probably a less than a 0.2 CD ratio. And when I talked to her, she said she had a little mild headache, uh, intermittent, which was relieved by over-the-counter analgesics. She had malaise and loss of appetite, about seven pounds over four weeks. You know, no temporal head pain, no scalp pain, no jaw claudication. I can tell you, she was not a sick looking woman. She was, I would say, your typical uh, Sarasota suburban. I, I think she was there in her tennis outfit. The question is, what do you do? You know, she's, you know, over the age of 50. And I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say she's extremely old. She's 66. Uh, she's got that disc at risk. You know, she's got very mild symptoms. You know, is this, uh, you know, is this something that's uh, arteriosclerotic or is this autoimmune vasculitis? You know, what do you do in a situation like this? Well, you get the testing done because his head rate was 96 and she had temporal arteritis. And <clears throat> this is exactly the, the way we want to be able to diagnose these patients. 
Uh, I saw her late and late in the afternoon and I consult from one of my colleagues. Uh, I got her to the emergency room. I spoke with the emergency room physicians. We, we, we had a plan. Her sed rate was massively elevated. And I can tell you, they, you know, they and the, the, the ER physician and the hospitalist both called to ask, what do we do next? What's the dosing? How much do we give them? When do we release them? What do we do next? And they're, you know, very, they're educated, but they're just not confident nor experienced in this. And we walked the patient within, within three or four hours. She, she was in a hospital bed with steroids going into her arm. Any acute vision loss in the elderly is GCA until proven otherwise. As I always say, and has been said by others, when you have acute vision loss in the elderly, which means over the age of 50, the first thing you need to consider is giant cell arteritis. And the next four things you need to consider are also giant cell arteritis. And the main vision loss is ischemic optic neuropathy. It's a hypoperfusion to the uh, ciliary arterial supply of the anterior and sometimes posterior optic nerve. It's a PION. And it can be arteritic or non-arteritic. Now, non-arteritic got some mechanical ischemic vascular uh, contributory contributors, where is an autoimmune vasculitis is going to contribute to the arteritic form. It is typically a unilateral presentation, but a high incidence of subsequent contralateral involvement uh, in arteritic ischemic neuropathies. Uh, the the bilateral involvement is 65% of cases within 10 days. Now with non-arteritic, bilaterality happens uh, uh, at over 30 months if it happens. Should you ever happen to see a bilateral ischemic neuropathy, that is not non-arteritic, that is arteritic. And trying to differentiate the, uh, the disc appearance, Historically and characteristically, arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy represents a pale swollen optic nerve. There may be some cotton wool spots, uh, there may be some juxtapapillary hemorrhages, but it is generally a pallid swell in the optic nerve. Whereas in non-arteritic ischemic neuropathies, it's a hyperemic swollen nerve. There's a dilatation uh, of the retinal of the disc capillaries, uh, and a TL injectasis of the disc capillaries, and it's trying to reperfuse part of the nerve that has been infarcted. So these are hyperemic swollen discs. Now, non arteritic, you, you can have hypertension, diabetes, uh, atherosclerotic disease, uh, hypercholesterolemia, and very important small crowded optic nerves, the, uh, the disc at risk. 98% of patients with non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy have a 0.2 or less CD ratio, and the other 2% of patients were just misdiagnosed. Six to one, they're going to have inferior visual field defects, and we do not have an anatomic explanation for this. But six to one is going to be an inferior arc rate defect, much like you see in glaucoma. They can have a progressive moderate vision loss over probably several days. And there can be some improvement uh, spontaneously, a few lines of vision. This is a bit of a younger disease. The, the earliest I've ever encountered was in the late 30s and early 40s, but of course it can go all the way up until death. But this is a pain, pain, painless disease, no pain. Arteritic, as I said, is a pallid swollen nerve, often flame-shaped hemorrhages, uh, arterial attenuation, nerve fiber layer infarcts. Now, I think a nice clinical pearl to always remember, uh, patient, older patients who have unexplained cotton wool spots, retinal infarction, you should consider this disease and at the very least perform a, a systemic history. They've got pain of some sort jaw pain, head pain, eye pain, facial pain, neck pain, girdle pain, hip pain, shoulder pain. They, they're, they're uncomfortable to, for the most part. And it's a severe optic nerve dysfunction. Whereas if you can measure the visual field, they have functional enough, you know, acuity, you can do, do a visual field. Again, it's usually going to be an inferior arc or defect. 
Giant cell arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica are risk factors. In fact, PMR to me is, is giant cell light. It's giant cell wannabe. It wants to go on to this more, uh, this more vicious type of disease. Typically, it's in the 70s. The average age is either 72 or 73, depending on what study you look at. It's uncommon under 60, but it does occur. Bottom line, anybody over 50, it's always on the menu. And I said, there's a high risk of, uh, of bilateral involvement. So diagnosing, we have to ask directly about the non-visual symptoms. Headache occurs in about 90% of these patients. Scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, ear pain, arthralgias, temporal pain, uh, temporal tenderness, malaise, intermittent fevers are all very common. We're going to do our examination and correlate it with the, with the presentation. And we're going to need some lab studies. And the three that we really need are the sed rate, c reactive protein, and platelet counts. Uh, sed rate can be lowered by statins and NSAIDs. A lot of times patients are using these medicines. It can give you a false negative. C-reactive protein is not usually affected by the statins and the platelet count is often very elevated. And sometimes you can also look at hemoglobin. Hemoglobin levels will also be very low. So these are all things that we, uh, we have to look at. And I will, I will tell you, in patients that don't have the disease, their tests are low. You know, their sed rate is like one or two. And their C-reactive protein is something at a similar level. It's when they, you know, we you get to those marginal, uh, high normal ranges that you really have to worry. So initial symptoms in giant cell headache, big one. Polymyalgia rheumatica, you know, chair and stair. I, I had an 88 year old per, uh, fellow who had uh, arteritic or ischemic neuropathy. And, and I, you know, I, I started talking about uh, pain. He said, doc, I'm 88 years old, everything hurts. But, you know, you think chair and stair. Chair, they have difficulties getting out of their chair. Stair, it's hard to walk up the, 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 the stairs. These are the muscles involved in PMR. You can add in their hair. It hurts when they comb their hair. And I used to use the word fair, meaning that this is predominantly a Caucasian disease. But we're actually wrong about that. And our understanding of thinking that giant cell is primarily a Caucasian disease, came from a population study many years ago in Olmsted County, Minnesota, where most of the patient people were Caucasian. When the same uh, study was done in Baltimore, it was about a 50-50 between Caucasians and, uh, and people of color. Fever you know, is often present. Visual symptoms without vision loss, transient ischemic attacks, and transient diplopia. Weakness, malaise, fatigue, these are all initial symptoms. Now there's one thing that these all have in common if they have these symptoms is they have a normal exam. A patient with giant cell can have a perfectly normal exam, but when you hear headache, you, you see someone who's failing to thrive, we have to consider ordering the proper serology. I probably order set, you know, GCA testing at least two to three times per week. And many times it comes back normal because they don't have vision loss or ocular symptoms. They're just older people with headache. And that's what I want. I want it to come back normal. So vision loss and ocular findings in giant cell, arteritic ischemic neuropathy, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. About 5% of central artery occlusions are not embolic, but they are thrombotic uh, and they are from giant cell arteritis. PIO and posterior ischemic optic neuropathy where they have a normal appearing optic nerve is virtually always going to be giant cell arteritis. Transient ischemic attacks, we have transient monocular vision loss of several seconds to several minutes and it has since re recovered. You know, that's a strong premonitory finding in patients with giant cell. And that usually happens a few weeks before they actually have an ischemic event involving the optic nerve. And transient diplopia. They may not be ophthalmoparetic in your office, but they have transient double vision. 
And more likely than not, it's ischemia to the muscles and not ischemia to the nerves. And if we take a look at the, uh, the vascular distribution, uh, we've got the temporal artery right here, and that is biopsy because it is the most accessible and expendable vessel that we have. You'd have a better yield if you were to uh, biopsy the aorta, but unfortunately, we, we actually need our aortas. But you can see how it can be involved, the occipital artery, the temporal artery. You've got things in the neck. You know, we, we, we've got the lingual artery, the facial artery, the thalamic artery. You know, we can have scalp pain, jaw. So we can see the whole vascular distribution. It doesn't have to just be right there in the temporal artery. Just that's where we can most easily find. A lot of times patients complain of, of occipital headaches. So making the diagnosis, we look at the prodromic findings, the symptoms, you know, we, we get the serology, send rate C reactive protein together, very highly sensitive and specific. Uh, platelet counts will be elevated. There are a number of things that we can look at. Now, ultimately patients do get biopsied. And the problem with biopsies are the false negatives. And a lot of it has to do with who, the pathologist who reads it. I'm involved as an expert witness in a case involving uh, temporal arteritis and the biopsies were negative until they were read by somebody else on the university level and they became positive. So sometimes a negative biopsy, you know, the report says no giant cells, no active arteritis. Okay, get a, it's negative. But if you read the details, they say focal interruption of the internal elastic lamina, that's a healed arteritis, they've got the disease. And the reality is actually, we're getting away from temporal artery biopsy. In fact, in Europe, they don't really do temporal artery biopsies any longer. They do temporal artery ultrasounds. And we have a vascular surgeon in my area who does a very, very good job with temporal artery ultrasound uh, it is non-invasive. It's easy to get done. It's pretty effect, pretty, uh, pretty accurate. So that is what we are leaning toward now rather than biopsies, which are fairly easy to get. Ultrasound tends to be just as good. Treatment. So Joe, yeah. Joe, there's, there's a question. And then the, I have a question is, you know, obviously when you do a biopsy, you're looking for the giant cells. What happens with a ultrasound? Well, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't fully know all the details of it, but they're looking at, at flow velocity through it. Maybe some narrowing since there's- hey, Well, yeah, of course, narrowing, but they're also looking for, at, for, at, at flow differences as well. Okay. Prop steroids, some hydration, got to wash the diabetes, got to give them something so they can sleep. And really IV is the best way to go because it's very effective in preventing second eye involvement. It can sometimes restore vision in the other eye. And this is best done through the ER because you know they're getting the steroids. And what do they need? They need 250 milligram solumedrol QID for three days, followed by about 80 milligrams of oral on discharge until they, they see a rheumatologist. And it's important to know these numbers, you know, 250 milligrams IV solumedro every six hours for, for, uh, for 12 dosages, because the ER physicians, the hospitals all call me. I see about one case of this uh, per month of true arteritic ischemic neuropathies. So pause right there because we have a question in the chat box and it's perfect for this right here. Mm -hmm. It says, what dosage of IV methylprednisolone would you give her? So same are we thing. doing solumedrol or yeah. well, you want to, I'll let you run with that. Yeah. Same, same, re really the same thing. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it's going to be 250 milligrams uh, every six hours for 12 dosage. And you know, th then they're going to ask, you know, when can we release them? You can release them after three days. What dosage of steroids should they be on? At least 80 milligrams of oral prednisone until they can get into a rheumatologist, which is ultimately where they need to be. Any other questions, Greg? Uh, that gets you caught up. All right. Now, the question always sometimes comes, do, do, we, do we get the tests? You know, if, if you think it's non-arteritic, well, 
Unless it's like medically impossible for a patient to have arteritic uh, ischemic neuropathies, the answer is yes, you get the test. Why do you, because non-arteritic is diagnosed in the negative. It's not diagnosed by what it is, it's diagnosed by what it isn't. So intuitively and logically, how do we diagnose non-arteritic? By proving it's not arteritic, it makes sense. So whenever I see any sort of ischemic neuropathy, even if there's a remote chance, sed rate, C-reactive protein, platelets, it, it, it doesn't hurt, and I'll get it through the ER, and I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get at least a sed rate done pretty quickly. And if it isn't arteritic, you're going to get a sed rate in the two to three range. If you're up around forty, well, then you're 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 dealing with another type of disease. But yes, we still get the testing done, even if you think it's not arteritic. So, Joe, like you're saying is you have a patient that comes in with a headache and you go, well, I don't think it's uh, arteritic or, you know, it's not arteritic. Well, how are you going to call it not arteritic? Because you, that's why you order a blood, a lot of blood work. Yeah, it's diagnosed in the negative. You got to prove it's not arteritic. So it, it, it's really pretty, uh, pretty intuitive. Right. So always remember the big, I remember the big E's in GCA. They're E elderly, the ESR is E elevated. They only see the big E on the I chart and it is E emergency. And if you can remember that, that'll keep you out of some trouble with this. So GCA, any sudden vision loss in the elderly, first and foremost, you've got to consider giant cell. 28 year old female presents with horizontal board vision and visual gray outs. Intermittent horizontal double vision and chronic headache getting worse over two days. She claims white coat hypertension and a shoulder injury for about six months. She's using muscle relaxant. Her height and rate, she's 5'3", about 220 pounds. Her, her entrance tests are normal. And she looks like this. And we have bilaterally elevated nerves. We have some juxtapapillary edema and folding of the retinal tissue there. And we would call that as a patent's lines. I think that brings me to polling question number three, Greg. And actually before, you, before well, I'll, I'll just go back for a second. Now, 28 years old, she has a very high BMI. Otherwise she's normal horizontal double vision. And we see what her nerves look like. And that brings me to polling question number three. Now, Greg, if you're wondering what these are, on the left, these are rainbow lorikeets. They are native to Australia. They're little nectar eating birds and uh, they're in the parrot family and very, very beautiful little birds. The one on the right is a sandhill crane and that happens to be native to my backyard. And that is my backyard there. I was going to say that the, uh, the one on the right looks like your backyard, Joe, if, but it, and it was. So. It is native to my backyard. So what's the most likely diagnosis for this uh, young woman? Is it a pseudotumor? Is it a real tumor? Is it idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Or I don't know. That's why I'm here. Which is not a bad answer. It's actually a very good answer. It's just not an answer that they allowed on national boards. Unfortunately. But if we were in charge. Indeed. All right. We're up to 82. I'm going to end the poll. Share the results. And the these are these are very good, uh, very good answers. Pseudotumor, IIH, real tumor. You always know, consider that. And you know, sometimes we, we just don't know. That's why we're here to learn. Well, she's got a dull ring in her ears. Her blood pressure is a little bit elevated, but not at a malignant hypertensive level. By microscopy, she's normal. Visual field, she's got blind spot enlargement and a nasal step in each eye. Serologically, she's normal on imaging. She had some small ventricles. Otherwise, she was normal. No other findings, no venous sinus thrombosis, no mass lesion, no hydrocephalus. Lumbar puncture, 510. All CSF studies were normal, no infection. Her diagnosis was pseudotumor cerebri or IIH. And we're gonna talk more about the differentiation between those. 
Papilledema is what she really had, bilateral disc edema. I've only seen one case of unilateral papilledema in my career. And we have inferior and, and, and superior aspects of the disc being most uh, uh, edematous, where we start to lose the, uh, the vessels. We, we kind of lose our ability to see the vessels superiorly and inferiorly. Hemorrhages are common very early on. There's usually no spontaneous venous pulsation. And that juxtapapillary edema that advances and regresses or patents fold is really pretty characteristic of, of papilledema for increased intracranial pressure. Visual field defects, they usually start off in a large blind spot. They develop glaucoma-like defects of arcuate defects and latent disease can have very constricted visual fields. There's usually no afferent defect because of the symmetry and the vision is usually typically normal. Symptoms, transient visual obscuration, typically when they bend over to pick something up or, or tie a shoe or something like that, where they make these visual gray outs of about 20 times per day. And they often have an intermittent horizontal diplopia with an esoposture and actually a six near paresis. Headache is very common. Nausea and vomiting can occur from papilledema, increased intracranial pressure, uh, and dizziness and tinnitus as well. So papilledema comes in a couple of forms. There's acute, chronic, and atrophic. Acute, lower left, you know, very wet, very hemorrhagic, exudative, very hyperemic, and a lot of nerve fiber layer uh, juxtapapillary edema. Chronic, which we see in the middle, there's not much hemorrhage or exudate. It's really pretty dry. And there may be some collateral vascularization forming at this point. And the far right is atrophic. And this is what's going to happen when any disc edema becomes chronic, it starts to atrophy and it loses its swelling because dead things won't swell. And this is from axoplasmic stasis. The cerebral edema from increased intracranial pressure is getting transmitted along the meningeal sheets of the brain and the uh, optic nerve sub subarachnoid space, giving it this engorged swollen optic nerve. Now, papilledema can have can result from intracranial abnormalities. You've got increased brain volume, such as a mass lesion that we see here. You can have increased blood volume from an intracranial hemorrhage or increased CSF volume from the hydrocephalic state that we see here. Now, you don't need a tumor this large to cause papilledema. A smaller tumor, tumor that prevents uh, cerebral spinal fluid flow through the aqueducts can lead to the hydrocephalic state. So of course we wanna make sure what we have, we wanna rule out the masqueraders. Acute papilledema is in an urgency. I mean, if, if a patient doesn't really have any vision loss or very, very minimal vision loss, you know, we've got some time to, to figure things out, but I use, my sense is I like to use the hospital emergency room I can get the testing done pretty efficiently, but you've got to help them. You have to tell them what you're looking for and what tests to do. You do want to rule out mass lesion, and if it's normal, a lumbar puncture can help measure the CSF pressure and also look for meningitis or other signs of infection. Atrophic papilledema with significant vision loss is emergency because you're going blind. You've got to be very aggressive. They're, they're losing their vision. And papilledema, but with any other neurologic abnormality, such as uh, uh, febrile nature, stiff neck, uh, there can be a, an intracranial infection, an intracranial bleed that we have, to, uh, we have to address immediately. Now, Greg, I know, I know you love this part. This is one of your, one of your favorite songs. Differentiating pseudotumor from IIH. And I know a lot of people think that IIH or idiopathic intracranial hypertension is simply the modern version or a modern term for pseudotumor. It really isn't. The best term to use is actually pseudotumor. Pseudotumor means increased intracranial pressure, but there is no tumor. That's all it means. But there are other causes. Venous sinus thrombosis. Uh, vitamin A use, tetracycline use, uh, oral contraceptive use, all leading to a hypercoagulable state. You know, when this happens, there's no tumor, but there's increased intracranial pressure. 
We call that pseudotumor, but it's secondary pseudotumor. There's a reason. Now, if none of these causative agents are there, everything else is normal, we can call this idiopathic intracranial hypertension, IIH, or we call it primary pseudotumor. And this is what we, we associate with the young, uh, overweight females who are at most risk. So pseudotumor is the best term. If there is a reason for it to be there or a potential cause, we call it secondary pseudotumor. If there's no identifiable cause, we call it IIH or primary pseudotumor, but pseudotumor is still a very good term. So diagnosing, we want to have signs and symptoms that tell us there's increased intracranial pressure, some disc edema that can be subtle, and they have to have a normal, normal neurologic examination. The only thing they can have is a cranial sixth palsy. And the reason is when the pressure in the brain goes up, it does force the brain, the brain to, to, to herniate down through frame and magnum. And as it stretches out, it actually will, will stretch the sixth nerve across the clivus, giving a unilateral or bilateral sixth nerve paresis. Scans have to be normal, and scan has to include MRI and MRV, magnetic resonance veneography, looking for venous sinus thrombosis. So we have to have normal nerve neuroimaging. The CSS have, has to be normal, and it has to be elevated. And that's how we make our diagnosis of pseudotumor. Now, it is getting harder to get lumbar punctures done. More and more people are, are obviating the LP if you know the MRI and MRV shows no abnormalities, but the MRI does show an empty cell of tersica and a flattened globe. And you can actually see the globe, the back part of the globe flattening because of increased intracranial pressure. And this, the salaterska, which, which houses the pituitary gland, that gelatinous gland gets squashed down into the cella. It looks like there's nothing in there. If those are present, there's no evidence of fever or infection. You've got the typical female profile. Well, a lot of doctors will just presume pseudotumor and not do the LP. And that's not malpractice. And that's not poor care. That's just... We, we can really easily diagnose it now. So management, no visual loss, headache therapy, cetazolamide. And I can tell you 500 milligrams three times, three times a day is a wicked dosing. And of course we want weight reduction of about 10% of their body, body mass. They have mild visual loss, so cetazolamide will, will be used. Ferrosamide, tapiramate, semistamide are all possible substitutes. And again, weight reduction. With no or mild vision loss, prognosis is really pretty good. This is a disease that can be pretty much managed within about six to nine months. But here is where we need to be involved. All of these, you need to co-manage with, with, with OCT, field, and photos. Because once they get downstream to an internist, to a neurologist, none of these tests will be done. And the only true way of, of, of monitoring these patients is look at their structural, uh, the structure and look at their function. And of course, we want to encourage weight loss. And sometimes they may need a dietitian, or sometimes they may need, uh, they need, a, may, may need a primary care physician. But they need to lose about 5% of their body weight and keep the weight down. You know, many of these patients where I see them their headaches worsen with weight gain and their headaches get better with weight loss. And that combined with the, the nastiness uh, of acetazolamide, you know, that is pretty, a pretty good impetus for them to actually lose weight. Now here's an interesting patient we saw at uh, the Eye Institute. It's a 17 year old female, uh, five foot five, 155 pounds. And what we see here is Bilaterally swollen optic nerves. There is not much. Uh, there's not much hemorrhage there, so this looks like it's relatively chronic. We have some enlarged blind spots, very typical uh, of this condition. And we have on the OCT uh, nerve fiber layer that's really off the scale. 
On the Cirrus, we have this red, white, and blue. It's what we call the Patriot sign because it shows you this red, white, and blue like our, our US flag pattern and tells you how much juxtapapillary edema is actually there. She's a 33-year-old female with horizontal double vision and a headache and about 20 transit visual obscurations per day. They last several seconds, they go away. She denies oral contraceptives, denies tetracyclines, vitamin A. There's no exogenous medication, herbal supplement use. She had lost about 10 pounds and noted that her headaches had improved. Her blood pressure is normal. She's five foot five, 160 pounds, relatively modest BMI. And this is what we see. She looks to be some chronic disc edema bilaterally. We can see some of these juxtapapillary folds or patents lines advancing and regressing edema. On her uh, OCT, we have a uh, very pronounced nerve fiber layer, juxtapapillary, our patriot sign there. She has a bit of an arcuate defect in the right eye and a large blind spot in the left eye. You know, her imaging was normal. She had an uh, empty cella. She had flattened globes. Uh, I think she did undergo lumbar puncture, which was elevated. And she was diagnosed with pseudotumor. Of course, she had MRI and MRV. Hey, Joe, there's a question that might be a okay. perfect segue, uh, right? As you're talking about MRAs and such, mm -hmm. um, it was back at 848, but it's kind of the same timing as this. It says, which MRI of the head would you order? MRA, CTA, spinal tap, question mark. For pseudotumor? I am going to, I'm going to recommend a contrast enhanced MRI of the brain. And I'm going to tell them rule out, uh, rule out hemorrhage, mass lesion. I will also, you know, specify, look at cella tersica and the globes, look for flattening in the globes. I'm going to order an MRV and that's going to that's going to rule out venous sinus thrombosis transverse sinus thrombosis and once we get those tests then we can start to move on of course if there any of those tests are positive we go in a different direction if those tests are negative you know i'm going to discuss with the er physician or any physician involved whether or not we should go ahead and get a lumbar puncture sometimes they'll just do that in the er as, as part of the course. But I will tell you, people in the ER, physicians there, they are very grateful for your help. Now, this is very important as to what we need to be involved. This is the patient I followed her over several months. And we can see about three months later, some weight loss and some diamox. There is reduction of the disc edema. And we see the one visual field, the congestion we had, we now have a better visual field. Now. If I look at this nerve in isolation and three months later, I look at this nerve in isolation, what am I gonna say? I'm gonna say there's disc edema. I don't know if it's better or worse. That's why we take the pictures. Now, just imagine if I turn these arrows the other way, we go from here to here and we go from here to here. Now I can say there's a functional and structural change that is going on. The therapy is not working it has to be amplified. That's why we need to stay involved because neurology is not gonna do this, internal medicine is not gonna do this and they need the help. Severe uh, or progressive vision loss, there's optic nerve sheath decompression where they actually will just cut the sheath and let the cerebral spinal fluid out. To me, that's like unbuckling your pants after a, a big meal. High dose IV steroids, IV acetazolamide, or many of these patients will have to go to a CSF diversion technique, such as a lumboperitoneal shunt to drain it away. Greg, are there any other questions? Uh, nothing, Joe. And Joe, I got a person that's trying to log on, so I'm just gonna step away for one second. All right. Well, here's a pearl. IIH or pseudotumor is a slowly progressive condition until it's not. 
There's a subset called fulminant IIH that we all need to be aware of. It's the same diagnostic criterion that I just talked about for pseudotumor and IIH, but it is rapidly progressive. There is generally less than four weeks between the onset of symptoms and loss of vision or loss of field. And vision worsening can happen rapidly over several days. So these are people who need the CSF diversion surgeries or optic nerve sheath fenestration. These are emergency situations. So there is a fulminant IIH, which is a rapidly progressive form of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension when they can lose vision in several weeks. So be aware of that. So urgencies and emergency, we talked about GCA, we talked about papilledema. He's a 63-year-old male who has long, he's a long-standing glaucoma patient. He came with a sudden onset of orbital pain of three days duration. He is diabetic and hypertensive, on Coumadin with a pacemaker, kind of important stuff to uh, consider. And he's got no vision change. He comes to me as a, a walk-in glaucoma evaluation on a Monday. So Friday, he gets, he gets a headache. Saturday, he's worse. Sunday, he's worse. Monday, he comes in and he looks like this. And what we see here, and he's never looked like this before. He's always been previously normal. He's got a partial ptosis. And we can see that the eye is somewhat down and out. When I lift the lid, he cannot look up. He cannot look down. He cannot AD duct the eye, but he can AB duct the eye. And these are all very characteristic findings of a third nerve palsy, or maybe I should say a partial third nerve palsy. When I look at him uh, in terms of his pupil motor fiber of function, his left eye is two millimeters responsive as heck. His right eye is a five millimeter dilated unresponsive pupil that tells us we have compression. Most likely he has an intracranial aneurysm Specifically, he's got an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. So he's got a pupil-involved third nerve palsy, three days duration at least, most likely cause of intracranial aneurysm. I sent him to the emergency department with detailed notes and recommendations. My recommendations were partial third nerve palsy with pupil involvement, most likely posterior communicating artery aneurysm, Patient needs neurosurgical consult stat. Now, as a, and this exam was, was brief. The whole exam was about 10 minutes long. I looked at the patient. You know, I'm not worrying about visual acuity. I see what we're dealing with. I'm educating, uh, educating the patient and his wife. I offered an ambulance. They, they declined. And as I was describing this, I could see his wife was getting anxious. I knew the question was coming, and it did come. She said, how much is this all going to cost? We don't have insurance. My response was, it doesn't matter. He's going to die. If you take him home, he lays down, he's going to become comatose and it'll be too late. They took my recommendation. They left the office. Within 45 minutes, I had a, and my cell phone went off. He was already in a CT scanner. He was admitted for 23 days. He underwent two endovascular procedures where they packed the aneurysm and the coils, and he did survive. And he kind of looks like this right now, which was a secondary aberrant regeneration, which is uh, pretty typical after this condition. It never happens after diabetic uh, ischemic palsies, but after an aneurysm, this is usually what happens. His motility has not returned. His ptosis has largely improved. If he were to walk into any of your offices, you would be nervous. He has a third nerve palsy, but he has been treated. So this tonight is down and out with a ptosis. There's adduction, elevation, depression, deficits, and a patient can be isochoric or anisochoric. Here's another patient with a different prognosis. He's 83 years old. He's diabetic. Poorly controlled, blood sugar in the 300s, A1C around 11. Pupils were normal. We take a look at him. He's got a complete palsy. It's hard to, to identify the ptosis amongst the dermatochelasis. When we lift his eyelid up, his pupils were active. He cannot AD duct, he cannot elevate, he cannot depress, but he can AB duct his eye. 
Now, I only saw the patient on follow-up, and I know that he was neuroimaged through his primary care physician. And I looked at the, at the imaging report uh, on follow-up, and I can only imagine what had happened was the, the clinician who was working with the patient initially had probably overwhelmed the PCP with too much information, explaining aneurysm, compression, pupil, and probably made the comment of, but he's, he's got really bad diabetes, so this is probably ischemic. And that was the word the internist knew. So when I looked at the report, indication for imaging was brain ischemia. There are two errors that are made here. And what were they? One, they didn't tell the, the neuroradiologist what to look for. You're supposed to be looking for an aneurysm. And an MRI is exactly the wrong test to order here. If you're looking for an aneurysm, beginning with an A, Whatever is ordered has to have an A in it. It has to have an MRA or a CTA. To find the A, you have to use an A. There's got to be some sort of angiography done here. The world's best neuroradiologist in the world can't help you. If you don't order the scan, order the right scan and tell them what to look for. Now, I'm going to divert for a moment and give you some clinical pearls here, what I call neuroimaging for the primary care optometrist. This, I think will be very, very helpful to you. I don't read MRIs, full disclosure. There are ODs that do, I'm not one of them. My belief is in neuroradiology, what you don't know can hurt you a whole lot. That's why they have residencies in radiology and, and especially in neuroradiology. To think that I'm as good as they are is, is irresponsible. I was working with a, a neuroradiologist. I was made, he could point out on an MRI, the ciliary body. He can find the ciliary body in an, on an MRI. That's how good they are. So order the right scan and read the report to make sure the right thing was done. If you have doubts, questions, or concerns, pick up the phone, call the radiologist. Ask for a reread. Tell them where, where you're thinking, what to look for. Let them look at it again. And get a good relationship with the imaging center. Because sometimes they may say they have better results with MRA. Others have better results with CTA. So always know where you're sending the patient. So I'm going to so echo he, that. I'm going to echo that, Pearl, right. because I can't tell you how much I phone a friend, call. Hey, this is what I think's going on. This is where I definitely have narrowed down the you know, pie in the sky, right? Uh, pituit pituitary, uh, inferior, temporal, superior. Oh, temporal lobe. Uh, you know, visual fields are the pits. I'm in the temporal lobe, uh, temporal lobe, right temporal lobe. I can't tell you what's there, but can you tell me what I need to order to help find what's there? And uh, that has been such a value, value out there. And having friends to phone, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, phone a friend, so. Mm -hmm. So this is my, my cheat sheet, what to order, how to order it, and why to order it. If you got disc edema or suspect papilledema, this is a question we, they came up earlier. Brain MRI with a lot contrast, looking for a mass lesion, hydrocephalus hemorrhage, flattened gold, empty cell, and I write that on the note. MRB, separate, separate scan, looking for be, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, write it on the note. If you're looking at optic nerve or chiasmal disease, MRI orbits and chiasm with or without contrast with fat suppression. Fat glows white in the orbit. Things that happen to the optic nerve will be white. You're looking for a snowball in a snowstorm if you don't suppress the fat. Optic neuritis, when you suspect multiple sclerosis, MRI orbits and chiasm, with and without contrast with fat suppression, one scan. MRI brain without, with and without contrast, looking for paraventricular white matter lesions, second scan. Horner syndrome, and I, I, I just had a suspected Horner syndrome today, gonna have to go through all of this. Brain MRI with and without contrast. CTA or MRA head and neck looking for a cerebral artery dissection. 
MRI chest with long apex and brachial plexus, three scans. Or you can say Horner's protocol or image sympathetic plexus. They'll know what to look for, what to do. Suspected aneurysm, third nerve palsy, CT and CTA, followed by MRI, MRA, MRI with concentration circle willis. If it's a high risk of an aneurysm, send them to the ER and tell them what to do. But don't just send patients to the ER without helping them. They won't get it right. What will they do? If you have any of these things here that I show you, and you send them to the ER with no help, what are they going to get? Non-contrast enhanced CT of the head, because it's what they do. All right, that was my drum solo. Let's go back to the third nerve. The reason that we are worried about compression is the pupil of motor fibers coat the third nerve, so they're vulnerable to compression. But they are spared in ischemia, where the core of the nerve gets infarcted. So what we see here is the vessel, the posterior communicating artery, runs parallel to the third nerve. And an aneurysm that starts to expand will touch this, affect the pupil and motor fibers and the levator and the muscles as well. You won't get just a dilated, isolated pupil from an aneurysm. That doesn't happen. A pupil involved third nerve palsy is aneurysm until proven otherwise. An incomplete palsy is also an aneurysm, regardless of the pupil. Here's a woman who's got a partial ptosis and some difficulty looking up, right? That's an expanding aneurysm. About a third of all third nerve palsies are caused by aneurysm. But I'm going to qualify that. Just because there's a third nerve palsy does not mean there's a one in three chance. Depending on the clinical picture, there might be a 5% chance, there might be a 90% chance. Pain is pain. It's only helpful when it's not present. Aneurysms are always painful. Ischemic palsies are painful about 90% of the time. So pain is only helpful if it's not there. Vasculopathic thirds will resolve in time. They'll be significantly better in about six weeks. They generally will be resolved within about 10 week, uh, 12 weeks. But uh, aneurysms will, rupture, will likely rupture over time. So third nerve palsy caused by an aneurysm. 20% of patients will die within 40 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. Rupture of the subarachnoid subdural hematoma. They have bleeding. There's only so much room in that cranial vault. The brainstem is forced down through her uh, foramen magnum. It shuts down the respiratory center. They have respiratory collapse and they die. About half these patients will die overall. Average time from onset to rupture is within a month. 80% will rupture within 29 days. Many patients don't make it to the hospital. Now, if they get to the, if they get to the hospital and, and they've ruptured, there is about a 5% surgical mortality, and they're going to be neurologically impaired afterwards. Unruptured aneurysms, they generally do survive. Uh, a number can actually have some normal outcomes, not be in a wheelchair, and about half will actually have some recovery. Now, there are two ways to, uh, to treat this. One is with an aneurysm clip, which means a craniotomy, which means opening up the skull and putting a clip on, like uh, you put a clip on a bag of potato chips. The other way to do this would be to snake a catheter through the femoral artery. They will often put a stent here and then squeeze these coils like toothpaste to fill up the aneurysm. And by doing that and putting a stent in here, it holds the vessel open, but it prevents blood from getting in there. Blood doesn't get in there. It's not likely to rupture. Now, I used to say that you know, these are, these are equally effective, and they are, and they're equally, bo both our techniques are, 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 very, are very easy in the hands of a skilled neurosurgeon. And then one day I had a retired neurosurgeon as a patient, so I was asking her about this, and she said, no, nah, wait, she said, everybody's just really doing the endovascular at this point. She said, you know, you do a craniotomy, you're trying to clip an aneurysm, you open it up, she said, it's all bloody, and virtually every time it, I start to do something, it pops. Now I got all kinds of blood. I can't see what I'm doing. So the craniotomy and the aneurysm clip is, is not really pleasant. 
Never dilate a patient with cranial nerve three palsy. And the reason is somebody else is going to have to look at those pupils, either in the ER and neuro, you know, neurosurgery consultation. So don't dilate. You take a look, you know, do a non-dilated uh, fundus photo, uh, optos or, or whatever wide field imaging you like to do, undilated 90, but don't dilate the patient. Somebody's going to have to watch those pupils. So there's a question that came in. Yeah. It says, how does an OD go about ordering an MRI, CT, slash blood work? Well, first off, you, know, you, want, to, you want to know, what, what, you know what to order and, and what you're looking for. If you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself, remember, you're responsible for it. I said, I don't read MRIs, but I, I will report what the results are. And I have to follow up as to what it is. It's best to have <clears throat> lab, labs that you can work with, lab core, quest, or whatever, whatever it is, is prevalent in your area. And you write a script for it. And always put down your contact information and where to fax the results. The same thing with, uh, with, with imaging. There's a magnet on every corner. You know, these are, pro these are private facilities. You know, you, you reach out, you meet the manager or you talk to somebody, you, 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 you talk to the radiologist and you write the scripts when you need something, but always put your information. So if there's a question, they can contact you and ask you about it. It's all about the communication. Now, if you don't feel comfortable with it, you're dealing with an emergency, the emergency room is acceptable if you're willing to help, to tell them what you think, what they're, you're, you're thinking of what to look for and the best way to test for it. I hope, I hope, I hope that answers the question. Greg, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the MRI, the CT, you know, work, as we said earlier, with your imaging unit, um, if, like you said a million times, and it's worth echoing, if you're going to send it to the ER, just please help them out. Um, they, they, they need the eye help uh, and the connections of what's going on. Blood work is a couple different ways. You know, I tend to, tend to work with the primary care doc, um, because sometimes, a lot of times, the blood work is done, recently done. My MRI or my uh, electronic health record, we're trying to get it to connect, you know, to the universe out there. And we're playing around with that to be able to look at different people's labs and blood work. Um, and then there's times, you know, like in thyroid eye disease, if I just want a specific antibody test, I'll just order it myself. But like you said, Joe, I think maybe the question was just, you write it on a prescription pad, um, just like you would, you know, for any type of, you know, Maxitrol, Turbidex. You know, you write down complete blood count with differential. And Joe, just like you said, uh, make sure you have your contact information there so that you can get those results back. And when you're doing neuroimaging, you have to have a, a diagnostic code to go with it. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. You put down the ICD-10 uh, codes. Mm -hmm. so. And Greg, I, I, I want to echo what you said. When it comes to serology, if I'm looking for infectious disease, inflammatory disease, and Info, I will work with a primary care physician. I'll work with him or her. And sometimes those are PAs and nurse practitioners, all wonderful to work with because they, they know the intricacies uh, of, of, of how to interpret the results. Tell them what to work, what to look for. They'll, they'll work. The, my, my exception is, is with GCA. Very simple, sed rate C reactive protein and uh, platelets. Uh, I order that all the time. I give them, I give them the note. Uh, I get it back, you know, relatively quickly. And these are not people with vision loss. These, these are older people with a headache where I'm just fishing. Now, Any consideration for patients' insurance in need for referrals? Always. You, you, you always have to do that. And that's why, you know, my facility, uh, if it is non-urgent, I make sure they get prior authorization for me. If it is urgent, then it does. Then the, the, the insurance doesn't matter as much. If it is life and death, it do, it doesn't matter as much. I'll do that through the ER. So rules for imaging third nerve palsy. If you're looking for an aneurysm, you need an A. You need a CTA. It's very good for finding aneurysms. CT very good for finding blood. Uh, MRA pretty good for finding aneurysms. MRI, very good if you're wrong, it's not an aneurysm, it's something else. 
So really, they're going to need a CT, CTA, MR, MRA. They're going, to, they're going to need all of them. You can do it on your own, or you can do it through the ER if you're willing to help the ER physicians. Now the patient, different prognosis. 63-year-old female, diabetic and hypertensive, sudden onset of retroorbital pain. Not that she can't lift her eyelid up, or when she does lift her eyelid up, her eye doesn't move. It's the pain that bothers her. She can't look up, she can't look down. She cannot adduct, she can abduct. So she's got a complete third nerve palsy, people sparing vascogenic risk factors. Which is better, one or two? Well, she got better over several weeks, no complications. He was hospitalized 23 days to two neurosurgical procedures, but he did live. Always suspect the worst. I was talking about this somewhere out west, and optometrists in the audience actually, you know, shared a case where, in his practice, they they had seen a third nerve palsy. Plan was referred to ophthalmology the next day. Patient died from a subarachnoid hemorrhage overnight because there was aneurysm. So what is a risk factor assessment? Isolated third nerve palsy, an isolated dilated pupil, there's no risk of an aneurysm. Complete third nerve palsy with a normal pupil, low risk, especially if they're older and vasculopathic. A partial third of the normal pupil is a high risk. And a pupil involved third nerve is an emergency. You know, you're never out of the woods. Patient had a third nerve palsy for an aneurysm, underwent uh, an aneurysm clip. Now, those coils are all inert and MRI safe, but not all clips are MRI safe at, at that time. And it was not verified what type of aneurysm clip he had. He underwent uh, a follow-up MRI in a major medical center with a non-approved uh, clip in place. And it moved during the procedure and he died. You know, he, he was killed by the follow-up. So giant cell aneurysm papilledema. What else do we have? 39-year-old male, previous history of migraine, develops a new and worsening headache. Goes to an emergency room where he undergoes a non-contrast and hand CT and an MRI, which were interpreted as normal. He, now, he was, he was actually admitted for three days for all these tests. Imaging was normal. He was, he was, uh, he, he, he was given a diagnosis of migraine, which he already had. And medicated, so he, you know, he had a migraine, but this was a new headache. They said it was just migraine. He was released three days later. He develops horizontal and vertical double vision, and he looks like this. And what I can see here is a partial pal a partial ptosis in his right eye, maybe a little bit of an exo deviation. Looking left, he cannot ad duct the eye. Looking right, he cannot ab duct the eye. So here's a person who has got a partial third nerve palsy. He has got a sixth nerve palsy as well. That brings me to polling question number four, Greg. And Greg, do you, uh, do you recognize this person? I recognize the most famous person there as Joe Sapka. I have to disagree. I'm not the most famous. Anybody, anybody recognizes this person? He is actually a famous musician. You can put it in the chat room. I'll give you a second. So what's the, where's this patient's problem located? Is it somewhere in the brain, in the orbit? Nowhere, because the scans were normal. In the cavernous sinus, or I don't know. That's why I'm here. So is anybody? Uh, nobody's going to say who this might be. He's actually a very famous Swiss, Swiss musician. His name is Patrick Moraz. He was the keyboard player for Yes and the Moody Blues. And it was uh, quite, uh, quite impressive to me to meet a, meet a person who has played before 130,000 people in JFK Stadium and a million people on Rio de Janeiro Beach. You don't, you don't see people like that every day. So most people say that it is in the cavernous sinus, somewhere in the brain. Fortunately, nobody bit on nowhere because the scans were normal. 
Well, acuity and visual fields were normal. He's got a right pupil sparing third nerve palsy partial, concurrent six. He's got worsening headache. He's got lethargy. Where's the lesion? Yeah, it's gotta be in the cavern of sinus. And we have to worry about here based upon his symptoms, new headache, lethargy, fatigue, worsening headache, double vision. It's gotta be in the cavern of sinus. So call the radiologist for a second reading. Said, no, everything is fine. This cavern of sinus looks fine. But the pituitary gland looks a little bit chubby. Bing, 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 bing. So he gets sent back to the emergency room for a contrast MRI of the paracellar area, MRA, through an aneurysm and pituitary apoplexy. He had a pituitary macroadenoma with an intratumor tumor hemorrhage, and he had pituitary apoplexy. And interestingly, this actually spread into the cavernous sinus right on the right side and a little bit into the left side. It did not actually go north and compress the chiasm, which is why he did not have any field loss. So he was immediately diagnosed with pituitary apoplexy. He got admitted for endocrinological and neurosurgical evaluation. So pituitary apoplexy is a severe and potentially fatal condition. It occurs in a small number of pituitary adenomas and has the association of headache, vomiting, visual impairment, ophthalmoplegia, altered mentation, altered consciousness, lethargy, and panhypopituitarism. Now, this leads to a hemodynamic instability from adrenal cortical trophic hormone deficiency, and this can kill somebody. And this is a rapid expansion of sometimes unknown pituitary adenoma. It's, a, it's mostly a sudden ballooning up from hemorrhage or infarction of a pre-existing pituitary adenoma. But many times they don't know that it's there. Headache, 90% of patients, and it's a severe headache. Now, this is often overlooked in the ER because you know, when they think thunderclap headache, they start to, they start to think subarachnoid hemorrhage, venous sinus thrombosis, and cervical artery dissection. They don't think pituitary apoplexy. About half a patient will have some visual abnormalities. Bitemporal hemianopic defects are very common. This was very rare, and this patient did not have it. Cranial nerve three palsy or palsies are common. Uh, six is common, followed by three. They can have some facial weaknesses. So most of these patients were going to undergo CT scanning in the ER because they're looking for acute hemorrhage. Acute hemorrhage may be seen on the CT, but uh, these infarcts may not show up without contrast. So an MRI with contrast is really the most effective imaging if you suspect pituitary apoplexy. In this case, MRI is superior to CT. So what went wrong here? He went, underwent a headache protocol, non-contrast MRI and CT of the brain. It was all normal. He was diagnosed, uh, you know, just a bad migraine. When you tell him where to look, there was something suspicious. We tell him to go back and redo the test, knowing what you're looking for. It was very easily found. So you can have a good outcome in most of these cases. You know, medical treatment with hormone replacements uh, followed by. Uh, removal of the, of, of the adenoma and the apoplexy. This patient was medically stabilized. So this was the, in the height of COVID uh, before we had any vaccines. We're actually still in lockdown right now. He could have died because of that. So they really delayed the surgery for a while. He ultimately wondered what a surgical decompression did actually quite well. Greg, is there anything else going on there on the chat room? Everything is quiet. Last question, unless you, got, unless you got something private or direct. I don't have anything. Here. I don't think I do. Greg, do you have any questions or comments? I don't. All right. 78-year-old female, son of onsetatosis left eye. She had undergone parathyroid surgery the day before. They removed three uh, parathyroid adenomas on her. And her complaint was on the next day, she had ptosis. Now, her and her, her son had noticed her... her her eyelid was drooping when he drove her home, but thought it was just due to, to the uh, anesthesia. So next day she wakes up and she still has ptosis and she has headache and eye pain. 
and she calls her surgeon who gets a little bit anxious and sends her to the ER to rule out stroke. And Greg, what do you think she got there? Contract, she got a CTA. No, she got a CT. Non-contrast. Oh, sorry, in, CT, yep. So CT non-contrast CT. Of the brain, which was normal. So she comes in to see me about four o'clock on, on Friday and she's got this ptosis and she has a meiosis and I put apiclonidine in and she her eyelid comes up and her pupil dilates and she's now diagnosed with a Horner syndrome. And she's Horner syndrome and she's had neck surgery and you know, Horner syndrome and neck trauma go hand in hand like cookies and cream, uh, peanut butter and jelly. It just goes together. However, I don't like the headache. I don't like the eye pain. My concern is she actually has a carotid dissection. So what I wanna do is let's get the imaging again. Uh, she refused, I was just in the emergency room this morning. All right, but they, they didn't look for what I'm thinking of. And she absolutely refuses to do anything. And she said, well, you know, can't, can't I, you know, you're, you're an optometrist. Can I see one of your ophthalmologists? Well, there's nobody here. They're going to do the same thing. She said, well, can I see a neuro ophthalmologist? She says, yes. Okay, I see it now. I said, no, why not? Because it's 440 on a Friday. I'm the best you're going to get today. So she argues with me, fights with me. I convince her to take aspirin. Call her the next day on a Saturday. She feels a little bit better, but she still has eye pain and headache. I harangue her for several days. She speaks to her ophthalmologist uh, in, up in New York. Uh, she's a snowbird. His response was, if you don't listen to him, then leave him alone. You either do what he tells you to do or don't, don't go back. So she finally comes around after several days and she goes back for an MRA. And it turns out that she actually had a carotid dissection and she was at extreme risk for undergoing stroke. So I'm very happy that I got her on aspirin. I increased her dosage from 80, uh, 81 milligrams to the full, full strength aspirin. And I got her into stroke neurology the next day. And I think we can probably skip polling question number five. What's the most likely cause? I think I just gave it out she had a carotid dissection. I'm sure you recognize those two, do you not, Greg? I do. Those, those are my, my two, two, they're my two buddies. Or, yep. Yeah, two buddies, yep. Yep, those, those are my cats, they, they miss their uncle Greg. Yep, Roscoe and Pinka. So she had Horner's syndrome. This is disruption of the ocular sympathetic pathway which begins up here in the dorsal lateral hypothalamus, goes down the spinal cord to T1 for a synapse, climbs up over the, over the apex of the lung to the superior cervical ganglion, that's number two. Then it goes to the sweat glands, to the pupil, to the Mueller's muscle, one, two, three, a three neuron system, which is really quite, uh, quite vast and, and quite long here. Now, there are a number of etiologies for Horner syndrome. You can have you know, first order in, in this area here from the brain to T1. You can have stroke, uh, tumor. In younger people, we always have to consider uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, sometimes really bad osteoarthritis of the neck. Second order, we got tumor. We have uh, lung carcinoma, metastatic disease. Uh, we all know about Pancoast tumor. You know, this is a patient who's got a, a Horner syndrome, and they also have pain in the scapular region and weakness in the hand. We always got to consider these are people who have Pancoast tumors. And the third order, we've always considered these to be benign, but they're not really. There are a number of things that we have to consider. Uh, migraine phenomenon, zoster, otitis media, uh, neck trauma, but the one that we really have to be especially worried about is carotid dissection. And carotid dissection is a third order acute corner syndrome with eye pain, head pain, neck pain, face pain, some sort of pain is a new onset painful corner syndrome. 
You know, in the neck, the sympathetic plexus travels with the carotid artery. A carotid dissection is a linear tear in that vessel wall leading to thrombus. That thrombus can lead to embolus. That emboli can lead to stroke. And these are patients who are at extreme risk of stroke in the acute phase. 52% of these patients will, will develop a, a hemispheric stroke within about six days. Two thirds will develop within the first week, 90% within two weeks. After about 31 days, they're out of the, they're out of the, uh, the, the risk factors. They're out, out, of the, out of the risk profile. The vessel wall has repaired itself. They don't need neurosurgery. They don't need uh, vascular surgery. They need supportive therapy to prevent a stroke from happening. Whenever you see a Horner syndrome that you suspect carotid dissection, the painful Horners, it can happen spontaneously or it can happen as a result of trauma, either motor vehicle trauma, uh, whiplash trauma, surgical trauma, if you think it's a dissection, they need to go to the ER. They'll be evaluated for stroke. They'll be put on supportive therapy. They'll be anticoagulated, antiplatelet,ed And uh, I am very glad that I put her on aspirin. And I, and I think that could potentially have prevented her from having a stroke. I'm just taking a look. Uh, no, nothing else in the uh, in the uh, chat. I so did these are... launch the handout twice, Joe, way oh, at the beginning yeah. and just recently, just FYI. So any painful Horner syndrome that's acute, you've got to send them to the ER. Tell them what to look for. Tell them where to look and tell them how to look. Either CTA or MRA. Actually, CTA is better for finding... Uh, cervical artery uh, dissections. So those are the big, those are the big five. GCA, any sudden vision loss in the elderly, pituitary apoplexy, headache, altered mentation, lethargy, field loss, and diplopia, aneurysms, we got to consider pupils and third nerve palsies. Papilledema is a clinical suspicion, of course, carotid dissection when we have the acute painful Horner syndrome. So if you follow these, these are the big ones that we have to be aware of. And once we're, we're aware of those and we've ruled them out, we can take a little time to figure out what's going on with patients. And I've always said, if you listen to patients, they will tell you what's wrong with you. She's a 73 year old female who comes in. I was very new in my new practice, uh, probably just a few weeks. And I, and I heard her checking in. I was, I, I was, out of the way, but I could hear her. And she seemed very petulant, thought this is gonna be a very nightmare uh, examination. And she was not previously happy with her previous ophthalmologist and she said, they are not listening to me. She's a highly allergic patient who had pain and ear blockage on the right side of her face while gardening. She thinks something got into her eye. She's been treated with xylit, azocyte, antihistamine, hot and cold compresses, no improvement for, for a lid allergy. Her PCP has already tested her for GCA, which was negative. She's got a presumed allergic reaction, but the problem is there's no ist itching, it's persistent and it's unilateral. Now she is hypothyroid, pretty heavy smoker, and she looks like this. And, she, and I kept hearing her saying, they, nobody is listening to me. So my approach was, I'm just gonna listen to you. I let her talk. I'm just going to sit there. I just sat there and just let her talk. She told me the story, told me, you know, some more and more of the story. And I'm sitting there. I'm thinking to myself, I've seen this before. This is not lid swelling. This is not allergic reaction. That's atosis. And after she got done telling me her story for several minutes, I said, yeah, you're not allergic. It's not an allergy. You got Horner syndrome. And she, you know, she was shocked by that. Didn't know what it was. I got the iapidine out. This is pre-iapidine. She's got a very ugly frown on her face. 10 minutes later, she's got a smile under that mask. You can see the lid has come up, the pupils dilated, and she had, uh, she had a Horner syndrome. Let's see. All right, Greg. 
Here's the case, 25 year old woman involved with a minor auto action when she was hit by another driver. Very, very, very mild, right? It's a very mild kind of like a bumper car type of situation. Both cars were fine. She didn't have any head trauma, only a mild to moderate bump, no loss of consciousness. Next morning, she sees double. And we can see that she has a right hyper deviation, all right, which was worse than left gaze and right head tilt. And clearly she had a fourth neuropalsy occurring from relatively mild trauma. And we'll see this a lot in kids. We see this a lot in people who are, you have decompensation over time. You can see the marked hyperdeviation. In this youngster, she, there's a double fourth nerve palsy. She has a left fourth nerve palsy and the dolly has a right fourth nerve palsy. And this is a very, a nerve that is very, very prone to trauma because it is external. It decussates in the anterior medullary vellum. It goes around the brainstem. It is the longest of the cranial nerve of three, four, three, four and six. It's the longest. It is the most exposed and it is the most vulnerable to trauma. Now these long-standing palsies can present with double vision from decompensation. For the most part, fourth nerve palsies are almost never problematic. 40% are traumatic, 30% are idiopathic, 20% are vascular. There's only about a 10% chance you've got a CNS lesion that you really have to worry about. And again, you know, the vast majority, 90% are gonna probably have a very good outcome. So when you have isolated non-traumatic fourth nerve palsies, we do wanna evaluate for ischemic disease in older people. But non-ischemic causes are really very uncommon. We want to take a look to see, you know, is there a compensatory head tilt? We can look at the at old photographs and the compensatory head tilt can tell you that it's been there for a long time. But here's a 73-year-old male who's got a new onset vertical double vision. He's one of the first people I saw in my new practice. He had a fourth nerve palsy. You know, very, very, very simple, very easy to isolate. And two base down prism really uh, made him feel a whole lot better. But he also tells me, Doc, you know, I noticed my grip, my gripper is off. You know, he said, I got, I got that, like a weakness in my left hand. Now, medical history, he had been treated, for, he's being treated for lung cancer. Uh, he is on a maintenance chemotherapy uh, induction. And this is about the only fourth nerve palsy I've ever had neuroimage because of a complication, a hemiparesis. He's got a history of lung cancer. I saw him on a Thursday. By Monday, he was in the hospice. He had brain met metastatic disease. So here is a pearl. Never diagnose idiopathic or ischemic anything in a patient with a history of cancer. Neuroophthalmically, it's cancer until proven otherwise. Now, there's a big difference between a woman treated uh, for breast cancer 20 years ago with mastectomy versus a man treated last year for prostate cancer, but it's always cancer until proven otherwise. He's a 77-year-old male. He comes in, he and mostly his sister were insistent on cataract surgery. 2040, 2070, commensurate with his nuclear sclerosis. He has got chronic horizontal double vision, which has gotten worse in the last two weeks. He's got a left abduction deficit of about 40%. Now, medical history, inoperable chondrosarcoma. A lysis of the clivus, the left petrix apex, right? There's your chronic six nerve paresis. He's got compression of the jugular vein. He's undergone about 50 radiation treatments. He's got vocal paralysis. He's got cranial nerve 9, 10, 12 palsies as well. You know, this is not one that's going to end well. I imaged him with a CT. You know, I had to use CT because he had pacemaker. And he had new soft tissue mass in his left nasal pharynx. There was likely a squamous cell carcinoma accounting for the worsening of, of his, his six nerve paresis. And at that point, you know, they said they're, they're going to seek no more, no more treatment at all. He is going to uh, just, you know, let nature take its course, so to speak. 
And yes, I do see a fair number of patients with neuroophthalmic disease that ultimately ends up being cancer, but in virtually every situation, it's known cancer. You know, it, it wasn't a surprise. So if you're looking for a probable mass causing a six nerve palsy, two places where a tumor can hide is the base of the pons and the cavernous sinus. And when working with a radiologist or neuroradiologist, this is where you want to tell them to look. And if you're watching a presumptive ischemic six nerve palsy and you're wrong, it's not like a third in an aneurysm. You've likely not hurt the patient. So when dealing with, with, third, with six nerve palsy, you've got some time to do an evaluation. If you watch them for a while and you're wrong, it's not ischemic, you've really not hurt the patient. Lots of material here. I know we're almost down to the end, Greg. How much time do we have left about? Uh, I don't know, four to seven minutes. All right. Then we're going to start landing with a couple of things. Uh, here's an interesting, interesting case that got referred to me from one of my colleagues, a 78 year old male who develops acute onset, double vision, blurred vision and dilated pupils. He went to the emergency department. He got worked up for a stroke. He, he actually brought all his reports. He had a CT, a CTA, an MRI, MRA, I'm sorry, I should put that in again, MRI and MRA, all were normal. Everything that should have been done was done. Everything was in order. So he, he referred, he, he's referred to me by one of my colleagues, and this is what I call neuro, this is neuro-op nonsense. And if you listen to the patient, they will tell you what's wrong with them. When I see the patient, he's been, he's been to the ER, he's been evaluated for stroke very well, when he comes to see me from my colleague in the practice, he tells me his vision is improving. His pupils are less dilated. Uh, they don't look dilated to me at all. In fact, his wife said he looks normal. He felt they were still dilated. He had endpoint nystagmus and a nonspecific horizontal diplopia. He was on an anti-muscarinic for, uh, for, for overactive bladder, but there's been no change to those medicines. Uh, so you got medriasis and blurred vision. And I can tell you right now, when you hear that, those two things together, think toxicity. There's something toxic going on. Blurred vision, medriasis, there is something that's been ingested that's been the problem. And I tell you, when, when I do these neuro-op evaluations, I, I, I sometimes feel like a charlatan because I'm just sitting there talking to the patient and letting them talk and listening to them. <clears throat> somewhere during the exam, I'll pull a slit lamp up and look at the eyeball just because I want them to feel I actually did something. But yeah, I, you know, tell, tell me your history. What, what happened when you started, when, when this all began? He and his wife drove from Connecticut straight down through the night to Sarasota. They only stopped to use the bathroom, get gas, swap off driving. And he took advantage of this, uh, of, of this uh, special at 7-Eleven of a big gulp, Diet Dr. Pepper. He said, you, you buy it, you, you get a free refill whenever you want. So we talked about how much he, uh, he drank. He drank about this much, I would say, in the course of, of, of 24 hours. And he basically had a toxic reaction. What was the outcome? I watched him within a week, he was back to normal. So always consider, it's not always a brain tumor. We gotta think about medication toxicity. Toxicities, you got blurred vision, dilated pupil. What are the, the, the toxins we have to worry about? Ethambutol, a toxic optic neuropathy, amiodarone, pacerone, toxic optic neuropathy, uh, vigabatrin, constricted visual fields. So I'm going to start wrapping it up. We're, we're, we're at our time. Immediately referring to the emergency department is acceptable management if you are willing to help. Be available 
Speak to them in advance. Let them call you. What is best handling the emergency, the, in the emergency department? Suspected giant cell arteritis with vision loss. Suspected aneurysm. Suspected papilledema. Suspected apoplexy. Suspected dissection. And retinal artery occlusions and transient ischemic attacks. The best way to get your testing done efficiently is with the emergency department, but don't just send them there with no information because all they'll get is a CT of the head. These are all acceptable as long as you're willing to help. And I've tried to give some pearls on to how to diagnose and how to manage these things and how to work with some other physicians who, when we all get together, we are able to benefit the patient. Is there anything else? Sounds anything else in the in the chat room, Greg? I think we're about ready to end this. So thank you, everybody. We're getting close to the end of all of this. This is my coronavirus barometer. Watch Keith Richards because if he goes, then we all go. So, so there ready? is a question that did come in. Um, okay. And it says, is there a high false positive or false negative by doing ultrasound as compared to doing a biopsy? Good question. Uh, it, it appears as though temporal artery ultrasound is as effective as biopsies. You can't, you not likely to get false positives, but you are you are you do have the possibility of getting a false negative it comes down to the skill of the vascular surgeon so it helps to know who actually has uh, who has who has the skill and experience to do that good question so with that i'm going to stop sharing my screen greg let's 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 land this one and let everybody go home and go to bed including me well, Joe, thanks for uh, no other questions have come in. So thanks for doing a uh, neural pearls. Um, this was an interactive distance learning course. And, uh, you know, you took something that's scary out there for, I think, most of us um, and boiled it down, gave us, you know, a nice way to logically think through this in order to give us uh, some comfort uh, when seeing these patients. So good job on a, on, a, on a tough topic like this on things we don't see every day. Thank you. So with that, everyone, that's going to end the CE. All right. Uh, a few little housekeeping here for those who are on. Hey, Ashley, if you're still on, I sent you a direct message about your presentation you did at Florida. So um, take a look at that. Uh, it's in the, in the chat. Um, upcoming interactive distance learning courses. Um, we did NeuroPearls tonight. The next one will be May 10th. Um, there was a brief period, about 36 hours, where OCT and OCT angiography and retinal disease uh, was going to be there. Um, it's actually um, been moved down to the 31st, and I think that should be glaucoma instead of retinal disease, so I got to update that too. But we're going to do clinical grand rounds and optic neuropathies on May 10th. We'll be doing on May 17th clinical grand rounds and glaucoma, or the, I'm um, sorry, running the uh, glaucoma gauntlet. And then I'm going to be doing OCT angiography. I believe it's in glaucoma and not retina disease. Um, but that is flip May 10th through the 31st. And then you can see June. Uh, we have Sundays coming back in June. And then July, I'm not going to read all the different courses to you. You could see them there as I was rambling on. Interactive distance learning. Pretty much uh, every state is allowed. The key is to make, other than Florida, uh, make sure that you know how many um, Credits, you're allowed to do that, whether it's all your credits can be now because of the pandemic, 50%, 70%. Um, what Joe and I have learned is that the different uh, websites are not up to date and we'd have to call all 50 states and territories and all that fun stuff to know what's going on. So please be aware of what's going on in your state out there. Uh, upcoming live events, uh, we have the Sunshine State Summer Conference coming up for those that are from Florida and need your TQ credits and all the fun stuff there. Uh, we'll be doing that in Florida in June. We're gonna be at Mackinac Island uh, on August 26th. Anyone thinking about going here that keeps continuing to fill up that will sell out uh, book now. 
Uh, and then we have October 21st to 23rd. We believe that's when it's going to happen. We have to switch hotels. The Renaissance had another venue and they were signed the contract before us. Um, so we'll be looking somewhere near there. Uh, and then in 2023, we will go back to Scottsdale. We'll be looking into the Northern Escape and then we'll revisit the Strasburg with Rosenberg. Joe, anything on there that needs cleaned up with our live events? No, I think, you know, I think you have uh, covered all that pretty well. Okay. So housekeeping wise guys is what goes on the, on your credit card statement, not optometric education consultants. Probably in about seven minutes, you'll get an email of, uh, from us. Uh, it's, it will be the post event survey. It will have the handout. And within the next 24 to 48 hours, one to two days, you'll get two emails or certificate of attendance if you are doing this for credit. Uh, and then a replay with the post event survey. Please complete that. Tonight we had uh, Vanessa on as uh, OEC's conference uh, coordinator, administrator, and uh, the COPE administrator. So with that being said, um, I don't think there's any other housekeeping other than thank you everyone for being here. And Joe, I'll let you wrap it up as I stop sharing my slides. Oh, thanks everybody for attending. I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed it. We, we enjoy doing this. We enjoy sharing what we do with everybody. It's, uh, it, it, it's all in an effort to help everybody get a little bit better if you ever need anything from us, please let us know. Uh, contact us. Uh, you want clarification? You need a consult? Anything? You're not out there alone. You know we're we're here to help. So with that, you know, stay safe. We're almost all through this, and uh, peace and love. Bye bye, everyone. Bye now. I did have a.